Joel Garcia, it's a real pleasure to speak to you today. I'm really delighted to talk to you about monuments, and particularly a couple of monuments in Los Angeles. First of all, could you tell me, could you tell all of our listeners where we are now? What is this place? I think it's a very layered place. One could say, in, in effect, it's like a palimpsest. There's a buried history here and a visible history. So maybe you can take us from the buried history to the visible history. Yes, also a pleasure to, to sit here with you and, and chat today. Um, this is Olvera, Placito Olvera, the birthplace of this idea of a city called Los Angeles. Idea. An idea, yeah. Um, and so this is an area where, you know, Chinese were lynched a place where um, California Indians were auctioned off into, into, they didn't call it slavery, but they were auctioned off into slavery on a weekly basis, the same, in the, same individual. What period are we talking about? Oh my God, I wouldn't even call myself a historian, but um, early 1800s, early 1800s up until late 1800s. Um, you know, across from us, there's Union Station, behind you, City Hall. Um, adjacent to City Hall was that slave auction site. Um, behind me, you have where the State Park is at now, where the village of Yangna was, where there's, you know, there's the stream there and where, um, you know, there was, all this was a village and all this was a place of congregation where nature served as the infrastructure for gathering and communing and um, building and imagining um, and nurturing life. But now, you know, it's like brick layered buildings of this idea of, of trying to retell or tell what, this, what the history of Los Angeles is. And it's in many ways performative. Um, by, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, every Sunday you'll have the Aztec dancers here. Um, and having Aztec dancers here is kind of, um, I don't know, for me it's ironic because... And folkloric and... Yeah, intense. because even even the establishment of the city through, or, or this state through um, both the Spanish and, the, and, and Mexico, like there's really no relation to Mexico City, right? Like this, this idea of creating a, a very homogenous perspective of Mexico. Is it like an imagined past? A totally an imagined past. Like there was, I mean, Aztec dancing here in, in Los Angeles um, only goes as far back as like the 19, like 1976. Beyond that, there was no Aztec dancing here. Um, so it, it's a total tourist concept. You know, what do people want to see here? They think about Mexico because Mexico controlled California for a while. So the natural thing to do is to bring the most flamboyant thing that represents Mexico, right? Mariachi and Aztec dancers. When in reality, um, Mexico's way more than that, so much more than Mariachi and Aztec dancers. So this place, I mean, there's the Pio Pico house, which talks about, I mean, I would, I would kind of connect that to more the gentrification of Los Angeles. The, uh, redistribution of land, the displacement of people, the displacement of, of some of the, the founding families of Los Angeles. And even within that, right, like back then, um, the new narrative that's being told is that the families that founded Los Angeles were a multicultural family of black, Indian, and Mexican families. And that's, that narrative is now used as a way of silencing criticism around not only Los Angeles need to, to like reckon with its past, um, but as a total gloss over of history. Um, that if by simply highlighting that there was black families involved or that there was indigenous families involved in that settlement, that everything else is okay. And it's obviously not. And so this is kind of what the space represents. This entanglement of, of trauma, of also joy. I mean, it's, it's when you talk to some of the families that come from those, from those first encounters, um, there's also a lot of joy in it, you know, because they were able to survive by 
you know, by by assimilating at times, um, by being taken in by, you know, new 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 families. I could never understand that. You know, that's not my that's not my history. But to hear them speak of it is it, just something for me that that's pushed me to really um, broaden my perspective when it comes to this idea of reconciliation here in in the states. I'm just here in Los Angeles. Two words that you used, which are tremendously important here, and maybe you can address them. It's a word you just used of reconciliation, and another R word, the word reckoning. Yeah. So if you could articulate both this moment in time, which is an extraordinary moment of reckoning, or we, or so we think, and the desire perhaps for reconciliation and what that would look like. Sure. Um, I mean, the idea of reckoning is just accepting that things have happened. You know, I can't apologize for for things that I, I didn't personally do. But I'm an uh, I'm an indigenous person, and I live in Los Angeles. Tell us something about your background. Um, so, on my father's side, um, come from Jalisco. So when talk talk about mariachis, the birthplace of mariachis, right? Jalisco, Guadalajara. Si. Um, so on my father's side, we chol. My father's grandfather, so my great grand great grandfather, was fought during the Cristero Wars, um, and he fought not on the side of the state or not on the side of the church, but you know there was always local indigenous resistance to both parties. He was killed. Um, via firing squad in front of a church and my grandfather, my father's father witnessed that. And that's how they fled their town and arrived in Guadalajara. So that's my journey here. <laughs> On my mother's side, um, and we talk about like, you know, kind of reconciling with the past, right? Uh, on my mother's side, my grandmother was born in Detroit, Michigan, and her family stems from that, from, you know, from that area, also indigenous. They were deported during the Mex Mexican Repatriation Act of the 1930s. So my grandmother was like about eight years old, born here in the U.S., but deported to Mexico because they looked Mexican. And so my mother's journey begins at the age of eight, back to the U.S. They arrive at Tijuana um, and they, they live there for maybe something like 10, 15 years and eventually ended up back in the, U in, in the U.S. Um, here in Los Angeles. I was born up the street at the French hospital, which doesn't exist anymore. Why was it called that? The French hospital? I'm not sure, it was in Chinatown. <laughs> um, so as an indigenous person living in someone else's ancestral homeland, I always have to reconcile with the fact that my living here prevents some a California Indian from reclaiming their homeland. That tension exists with me on a daily basis. And as an artist, as a cultural worker, as an activist, that's central to how I do my work. I have to do it in a way that centers that, acknowledges that, honors that displacement, um, not to romanticize it, but to... Not to romanticize it. Not to romanticize no, it. No, precisely not, but to look at it judiciously and yeah, for a clarity. responsibility, yeah. you know, and do my work in a way that is building capacity for younger California Indians, especially those of origin of this, this place like Tongva and Chumash and Totavium, so that hopefully when they get to, you know, early 20s and they want to figure out what they're doing with their life, there's space for them to do that um, and, be, and feel fully supported and then move out of the way. I believe as an as an organizer, also as a, as somebody who's an arts administrator and and you know developing arts programming and at, in at times in leadership positions, you also have to know when to just get out of the way. Get out of the way. Um, so I do my work with that 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 um, I guess urgency to an extent, but also thinking about very much secession. What does secession look like? So it's not wielding power, not holding power, but taking care of this like stewarding this idea of power and leadership so that you can pass it on to the next generation. Um, 
And, you know, that comes from a lot of indigenous values of reciprocity, of gift giving. In gift a way. giving, yeah. And you accept the gift, but you also accept the responsibility of that gift. Um, so that's core to, the, to how I do my work. Um, so reconciliation, I feel like you took the term as something that happens within yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So once you, once you know like what, how you landed here, how you arrived here, good and bad, then I mean, I think the city needs to re like do some of that. There's a lot of good and bad with the city of LA, but the more we forget about the bad, the more we create, you know, these crazy scenarios that we're experiencing in this moment. So another word you just used, which is so important, is the notion of forgetting. Mm -hmm. And it's opposite, perhaps, of remembering. And I'm always taken by the origin of the word remembering, which literally means to put the members back together. Yeah. And in, in a sense, your work is a work of trying to put things back together. So talk to me a little bit about where we are here and what happened here at this very place? This statue that, or the statue that sat here was installed about, I think about 100 years ago. Um, and like many of that time, it was a copy of a copy, not even something original. It was just like, let's mass produce these. And it was propaganda. This little fencing around us and like this patio and everything um, is more recent. And it was, and it was, it's more recent because of the pushback with having the statue here. And so this city, instead of having conversations about like why people don't want this here, they dig in deeper and build more, right? So let's let's protect this thing. Let's let's add it more value to it. Sounds like something that's happening now, putting walls around. Yeah, putting walls around it. But what is the statue? What was what was the and statue? And so the Sarah statue for Father Junipero Serra. Um, you know, some call the architect of the mission system here in, in, in California, even though, and this is just kind of weird how like my own journey connects back to this, right? The, the development of the mission system comes from Guadalajara also from the archbishop there who designed this, tested it in, in Jalisco and Nayarit, and then said like, aha, I got like this project. And Junipero Serra was the implementer of that, that vision. So, through the mission system and through Sera and other, and other folks, you have mass incarceration, right? The idea of jails and, and repeatedly incarcerating folks in order to keep them or to create a labor force. So enslavement, right? Through, through, through imprisonment. Then you have also the idea of a planned city. So we plan the city this way, we can control the population that way. And so you get the first remnants of redlining, of, you know, um, planned communities. But you also have, like, single crop cultivation. And some of that, I like, I think back and, and, and wonder, like, wow, when we're talking about climate justice and the climate crisis we're in at the moment, like, this isn't new to California. California experiences with emissions. They cleared out areas and completely shifted the ecosystem. You know, Southern California is one of the most diverse, um, like biodiverse areas in the whole world. And to think that an outside entity came in deciding that this was, that this biodiversity here was, wasn't valuable. And what was valued was single crop agriculture you know, like just the notions of like capitalism, right? Through, through, through the functions of the church and all these layers that exist, right? Um, that's what this represented for a lot of folks. And then you get into, you know, the more interpersonal stuff, right? The more, the, the stuff that lives close to people, the trauma that gets passed on generation to generation. And it's like, you know, a lot of the sexual violence that occurred, a lot of the, the, kidnapping of children, you know, to, to save them, to save their souls and place them in families outside of their community, right? This idea of adoption um, comes into play. And 
in many ways like force like forceful forgetting you're gonna forget who you are you're gonna forget these teachings you're gonna forget how you interact with nature and and you know many times it was beat out of people and forceful forgetting can also exist simply because you're not taught the story yeah yeah you know and then then in more recent times you 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 get the rebranding that that companies do right and and the the mission project for like third and fourth graders that happens here in California, it's a complete rebranding of the California mission system of we save the natives from their savagery. We save them from, you know, being like brutal to one another. And we put them, we put them in, in these missions and they became civil, they became civilized. And now they're like a functioning part of the, of, what we call Los Angeles. These, these ideas of, of citizenship and civility. I always remember the words of, of a Tongva elder, Craig Torres. He does, he's also a teacher. And so he talks about the first encounters between the Spaniards and, and his ancestors. And there's writings, right, where they refer to um, to his, his, his ancestors as animals, like, you know, like we arrived here and we saw these beings, but we didn't recognize them as people, we recognize them as animals. And you would think that would be offensive to him, but he's, he has a total flip to it and says, I take pride in that because it meant that when they arrived here, they didn't recognize themselves as humans anymore. That they didn't recognize themselves as one in nature, that one, there were now these beings disconnected from everything else. And here we are living, living alongside the environment in full alignment with the seasons, in full alignment with, with the trees that they saw us as animals. So they're like, I take pride in that. I want to get back to that. I want to get back to when we're fully in, in, in sync with, with the weather, with the animals, and we all are just nurturing one another. We all have our turn. Today, we got to take care of the trees. Tomorrow, we take care of the animals. At some point, we get taken care of, right? When they drop and, and, and we harvest acorns and you know, we, we harvest abalone. He's like, I want to get back to that point. So this idea that they saw them as animals, he's all like, I take pride in that. Um, and just that, like, for me, when I first heard it, I was like, wow, like, yeah, totally, like, like flip the script on these things. So it's also too, um, how we recalibrate our lens to what we consider the humane thing to do when talking about reconciling with the past. You know, what is a humane thing to do at this moment when we're talking about police brutality? And where folks are asking to defund and abolish, abolish the police. Um, and folks dig in because it's scary, like, wow, well, I've always had police, you know, like that's who I call when something happens. But do we really need that? You know, we have this fence here, I guess, for safety reasons. The, the what, what would one be protecting here? Exactly. What, what is there here to protect? So I want to ask you, Joel, we'll talk about the monument, which when I'm looking at it is no longer there. So for me, it's a, a trip with my index finger, as I indicated, it's a trip in absence. But for you, it isn't a trip in absence at all. You know what was there. Yeah. So before we talk about the monument, let's talk for one more moment about Junipero Serra and who he was and why he was sanctified quite recently yeah. by the Pope. You know, that reframing or that just flipping the script that, you know, the Tong Velder Craig Torres did in that in one instance, I, I, I wonder if that's what what we need to do collectively as, as a population, right, as a city, uh, is to re reframe what humanity, what, what, to, what it means to be humane. When the call to defend the police, abolish, you know, the prison system, like, what does that look like? You know, why, why are we so, like, why do we dig in so much with this idea of, of safety and what makes us feel safe versus what makes us feel nurtured, what well-being um, is. I wonder like, if, if folks in the suburbs have ever sat down and, 
and had a conversation about well-being, about wellness, community wellness. And public spaces. And public also. space, absolutely. And I wonder if that's where where we need to where the conversation needs to go. What is humanity? Does it need to be redefined in this moment? And with Junipero Serra, I think when he was being, um, you know, enshrined as a saint, he was presented as somebody that was like the most humane person that Com the church. Compared to what? Yeah, compared to what? You know, there's there's these these um, these myths that he walked to Mexico City to ask for a native bill of rights, which is totally false. That he. Where does that myth come from? Um. A lot, I guess, comes from writings that exist between folks. Like you know, Junipero Serra wrote a lot. And his journals, there's, you know, he does indicate that he would wish that certain things would happen. That, and, and here's, here's the like, in relation to what, right? So Governor Neve, who's on the opposite side of the plaza, from my understanding, he was able to take control of Los Angeles in a certain way. In a way that the church no longer had jurisdiction over certain aspects of it, right? One being development this establishing of communities or, or new rancherias. And so he had the soldiers at his disposal and he would police the areas outside of the mission in a certain way that was in conflict with what Sarah thought was the best way of policing the Indians. And so that's where that tension was. So I think it's, it's misrepresented in the fact that he wanted a bill of rights for natives or for the California Indians, but rather he wanted jurisdiction over how California Indians were policed outside of the mission grounds. So was the treatment under Serra better than the treatment under Neve? Possibly. And that's where the myth comes up where like he wanted a bill of rights. He just wanted jurisdiction over California Indians, over the Tongva community, over the Tatavan community. Um, and I think that's where a lot of this misinformation comes from. You know, there are writings and there, you know, I guess the state and then the mission system is in opposition of one another. Um, but it's in relation to what? In when was he sanctified? He, he was sanctified. When was when, when did um, that happen? What was it? What would it be now? I don't. I think quite recently. Quite re five years ago. Yeah, something yeah. like two two thousand and fifteen. Yeah, something around five there. years yeah. ago. Yeah. There's been a lot of great work done by California Indian scholars up and down the state. And this is you know like to think that in twenty twenty we're we're just learning of stuff that we should have known a long time ago. That just now, you know, the missions are, are starting to like say like, okay, we can, we can allow folks to see what's here. Not just what we wanted to present, but just, you know, full, full disclosure. This is, this, is, this is what it is. The San Gabriel Church burning down, or San Gabriel Mission burning down, in many ways for some folks was like, yay, let it burn. <laughs> but for some of the Tongva members, and not just Tongva, but also like Tataviam, for them it was like, well, wait, there's history there that hasn't been seen, that we haven't been able to like analyze. So as much as there's, there's a desire f to do away with that, there's also that moment of pausing, sitting, like just sitting with, with the truth, right? Sitting with the truth for a bit. What does that mean? I don't know, because I don't think we've ever been there. No, but it's such a beautiful, Joel, it's such a beautiful way of, I, I, I nearly feel that we, we should literally think about sitting with the truth. Yeah. What, what does that mean? What does that look like? What does that mean for you? When you use those words, I feel you're, you're alluding to something. Yeah. So one of the things that we learned when we removed the Columbus statue 
leading up to it, there was a lot of tension, right? The Knights of Columbus were angry. Who are they, by the way? I've been reading about the Knights of Columbus. Who are those knights? Oh, man. What I've seen and what I've heard from them is, is they're like pretty invested in maintaining the idea of the church and what it represents and the goodness that it brings. Um, so they were angry about the removal of the Columbus statue. So was a family of the artists um, and a handful of Italian Americans. The day of the removal, we expected there to be like a protest or we expected some opposition. When it was removed in the most anticlimactic way. Tell me about it. Well, to, and was it authorized? It was authorized. So the county of Los Angeles was also like pretty scared of this moment. And they, you know, they delayed, they delayed, they delayed until they couldn't delay it anymore. We were able to like in, in, in a matter of days organize a small gathering. But the funny thing is that like in between those days from when, when when it was approved, the removal, to when it came down, all of a sudden everybody wanted to take credit for it. So and so wanted their logo on the flyer, this other person wanted the logo on the flyer, this person wanted to speak. Leading up to it, nobody wanted to touch it. But it was anticlimactic in a way because that like that release was in there. That release that comes from I don't know, just referencing back to the playoffs a couple of days ago, that three-pointer that won the game. There's that release, you yell and you, you, you cheer. Um, and there was cheering that day. But it, it wasn't that release that one has, like when, you know, when they do something and they're celebrated for it. When you graduate, you know, when you get that call that you got like, you know, accepted into school or something. You, you celebrate in a, in, a, in a very specific way. And so there was no release. But the one thing we learned was that the moment it comes down, those in opposition finally have the space, whether it's an emotional space, a mental space, or just a, this, this disconnect from their ideals to really process what that thing meant to them. And we learned that day that it means nothing once it's down. When it's on the pedestal, it means a lot. When it's on the ground or on the, black, the back of a flatbed truck, it doesn't mean anything. So we banked on that moment. If we remove the Sarah statue and give the community that moment and give folks who are so tied to Sarah's mystique and his idea of, of, of sainthood, if we give them that moment, then do we create a, an opportunity a space to say what the truth. And so on the summer solstice, June 20th, because we did a lot of, I mean, it was also, right, there's protesting happened, there's a lot of stuff going on, so it was a good moment to do that. But going back to this re realigning ourselves to nature, it was also the summer solstice. So you said like, that's the day. That's the day. Take me, take me step by step through that day. Okay. What, what, it was what also happened? Father's Day around ah. that time. We're like, we're not going to have another Father's Day with this father standing here. So there's all these so layers, right? Two fathers, yeah. Yeah. Summer solstice, father, son, and then this father. Like, so Father's Day was very much present during the removal of the statue. This idea of Father's Day. And the this, idea of paternity. Yeah. And, you know, the founding father of Los Angeles and all this stuff. And then <laughs> the idea of summer solstice as, okay, let's get back to being in alignment with nature and devaluing bronze and concrete and all these things that, um, that the city, I guess, values <laughs> over people. Um, so we invited a bunch of folks, you know, people who I'm closely connected to, but also people who are part of the city's, like, or like the efforts to feed folks, one other folks doing work around street vendors to support the street vendors. Other people who, like just people in general within this, like doing work within the city to make humanity better. Obviously the Tongva community was involved, the Tataviam community and the Chumash community, because it was 
really important for them to be part of this. And one of the things that at least, well, in many, in many tribal communities is that there's always gonna be different perspectives. And it's so hard to get everybody to agree to one thing. And we luckily were able to get all these different families to sign off on this moment. When you say we, I, I imagine you. Mostly myself, okay. but also like the, none of the work that I do, I do it by myself. It's always collaborative. It's always in conversation with so many other people, whether through text, whether through DMs on Instagram, but there's conversations happening frequently. Being in conversation with elders has been super important as well because you also know about the history of all the efforts that you know were in process before to remove the statue that just got stuck in the bureaucracy of the city. And then for once, we, we were able to get everybody on the same page. This is what's gonna happen. We're not gonna take this down and celebrate it as, as a culmination of anything, but we're gonna take this down to initiate something. This is gonna be the start of a conversation. And we didn't do it as a political act. We didn't do it as, a, as an opportunistic thing of like, this is happening now, um, but we did it simply to begin a healing process. And so we came together, close to 200 people. I didn't expect that many folks to come out. Um, some all, all here. Out here in the park. And you know, some folks got a message that said, we invite you to a ceremony, time and place. They didn't know what it was. They didn't know, but they trusted. That's the part that like is great, that they trusted that. You, create, they were, you created that space that, of trust. Yeah. And you know, when they showed up and what's the ceremony? This is what we're doing. Okay, nothing big. And we gathered together, shared some words, spoke about what it means to come together at a time where there's protesting, there's calls for racial equity, and you also had COVID, you know, taking place and it's still taking place. Everybody, get a roll. Some folks, this is the first time that they came out out of quarantine. They're like, this is such an important moment. I'm a risk going out into the world to be there. And we were here for maybe about an hour, hour and a half. The removal was all but like 15 seconds. Snap. I'll never forget that, that sound. You know, that like snap of metal and that clank on the, on the how floor. Did, how did it happen? Did you just... Well, it goes back to doing, as an artist, and you want to create something or undo something, you do research. And well, you've written, a, ma you've written yeah. a manual on how to remove statues. Yeah, a small little zine. Yeah. Going back to the punk rock days, let's put a little zine together, get it out there, let's liberate knowledge. Um, I learned a lot by reading it. <laughs> now, now I know how to remove statues. Great. Um, and we relied on that, right? Like we did, we did research on who owns the statue, who owns the pedestal, who controls the park, and we, we bet that the city would, would see this as an act of civil disobedience. So this was not authorized? This was not authorized. Unlike the statue? Yeah. The funny thing was that all this effort to keep the Columbus statue in place, money, time, energy, results in them doing appraisal of the statue and it coming back where nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing. L less than the inquiry to find out how much it was worth. Right, it was, they spent $1,500 to find out it was worth shit. <laughs> nothing, zero. So we figured, well, this is a similar thing, a copy of a copy, bronze object, worth nothing. If we remove it, they can't call it vandalism because it's worth nothing. It won't be a felony because it's not over a certain you know, value of damaged property. At worst, there's some huffing and puffing back and forth, 
but that's it. Because a lot of the work that I do as an artist, also as a, as a community organizer, and some of the folks involved, we've been able to build a lot of relationships within the city. And not just relationships on, on, on a person-to-person -person level, but trust in a, in a sense that they know that if we're involved in something, it's gonna go a certain way and that people are gonna be protected. And meaning that, not that they need to be protected from um, anything dangerous, but just that they're gonna be nurtured, they're gonna be cared for. So we also knew that if anything did happen, we, there was folks in the city that we could call and be like, we need your support, call the police off or something. So it's also about relationship building, even with folks that you might not agree with ideologically. Um, and that's where we, you know, we go back to reconciliation, like how do we all move forward together? So that was definitely part of how we designed that day. If we have a ceremony versus a political action, if we come together for healing instead of protesting, if we come together for you know, community building instead of pointing fingers, then do we shift, can we shift the conversation? So when we gathered and in, in a way set our intention for the day, this is what we hope to accomplish. This is, this is how we want to walk, walk away from this moment, go home and feel okay. Statue comes down and then we gather back again. And in between that, right, people celebrated and there was that release. There was that like crying. Unlike, unlike, unlike the Columbus, the statue. you had in, in effect learned yeah. something, we an, had important, to give, an important lesson. Yeah, we had to create that moment for people to just let go. Let go of whatever pain and, and, and emotions they were carrying, whether connected to the statue or not. And people celebrated, right? Like some folks built an altar on top of the pedestal, some children sat on top of the statue and reclaimed it as their playground. Um, and that was all great, but I think the most important part was the coming together afterwards. Black folks, Armenian folks, Filipino folks, Chicanos, Mexicans, white folks, everybody like, you know, a representation of the city came together, talked about pain, carrying this pain. You know, some of the women that spoke spoke about themselves as survivors of sexual assault, some for the very first time. Inspired and triggered by this moment. But also cradled by this moment. Mm. That they felt comfortable enough to talk about this in front of strangers. To share that experience as an invitation to come together. To share that experience as a, we can be better than all of this. It, it, we might not agree on things, but we can figure out how to really build this city with relationships rather than buildings. And I think that's what doesn't exist at the moment. You know, we have a lot of notions of, of, of community, but everybody's isolated, right? You have little Tokyo, you have Chinatown, little Armenia, East LA, and everybody's isolated. Everybody's segregated intentionally, right? Joel, why, why was it important to bring this statue down in the first place? I mean, why, uh, you, you're working so much now on the whole notion of monuments and it's an incredibly heightened moment in the US, but not only in the US, around the world. Confederate monuments, the These monument of Sarah, why was it important, this monument that had been here for basically 90 years, as far as I know? Imagine all the energy in those 90 years that it took to keep this statue there. And then imagine all these people around here walk with that energy. And it festers, it festers, and then it becomes anger, and it becomes resentment, and it becomes all these other things that don't allow us to grow. To grow. You remove it, then you have this big old void, a huge void. And so that ceremony and, and this process was simply, let's figure out how to refill this space now with good stuff. 
I think about all the energy that it went to keeping the statue up 90 years. Money, bureaucracy, politics, and just the idea of Los Angeles, right? And this romantical notion of like the founding of, of you know, El Pueblo de Los Angeles. All the tourism that comes, all the capital attached to it. And for 90 years, it just creates anger, creates resentment, creates tension, and all that energy just festers and it blocks us from really getting to know one another, from healing from all the stuff that's happened. So we thought if we remove it, we'll also have this big old void that can now be filled with a bunch of good stuff. What should fill it? I know you have thoughts about this. What should be in it? Now we have an empty pedestal wrapped around with very colorful ribbon, red, black, white, yellow. Add some color actually to this yeah. guarded square. What, what do you envision it should be? I know that one of, one of the comments you made, which I loved is maybe birds. Well, funny that you mentioned the colors because it reminded me of this, right? So in, in many traditions, the white to the south represents our ancestors, the folks that came before us. And then we have the black to the west, right? Where the sun sets. Um, and that has a, a, another meaning, you know? It, it represents, it, you know, for some of us here, it's like the women because it refers to the ocean, right? Life-giving. And then we have red to the north, um, which can represent also like the sacrifice that comes into it. And then we have yellow to the, to the east where the sun rises, all these new beginnings. So there's a new Beautiful. beginning, right? But it, in order not to replicate what, the same errors that we've done in the past of saying like, well, this is what it should fill it. I think rather it's an invitation for us to come together and figure out collectively what what we put in there. What do we value? You know, we value at this moment capitalism. We value these ideas of safety. We our values are totally skewed. And when I when I say like we we, we sit with our truth, it is that it's it's like let's figure out what we really value statue fell I figured they would come pick it up right away with the police and that's where the huffing and puffing would happen but instead but instead it sat there for three days on the ground on the ground nobody came and picked it up and learning from that Columbus moment it's like once it's down once it's off that pedestal even the folks who want it there have let go of that, of that value to it it means nothing to them anymore the symbolism of it falling. Yeah. That release. Even for them, it was a release. They're able to see this in a whole new, different way. And we hoped for that. We didn't think that would happen. But we also learned. We thought they would pick it up right away. But seeing that they didn't gave us a new opportunity to learn. Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe there's, there's, growth happens faster than we thought it would. Maybe that re reconciling of, of the past can be done a lot quicker than we, we imagined it could, which is great. Those are good things. But also, it's like we're sitting here in this park where there's a lot of unsheltered folks. Where is that statue now? Where is it? Where is that statue now? Um, how is it um, living its unpedestal moments? From what I understand, it's here down First Street, um, in a climate controlled warehouse. So, you know, it came down at the start of summer, summer solstice. People protesting, people being evicted, losing their homes because of COVID, because they can't work. And the statue sits nice and cool while folks are out here enduring the heat of the summer. Like to me, that's just like, it, it underscores how, how much our values are misaligned how inhumane our values are. By removing that statue, we can have that conversation because it, it allows other stuff to be highlighted. 
and it sits there alongside another Sarah statue that came down the following week. To Sarah's statue. To Sarah's so statue. The, the, statu city, the statues can speak to each other. I'm, I'm assuming they, they are. <laughs> they are having a conversation. They're having a conversation. What do you think they might be saying? I don't know. One might be saying, I'm hoping one is saying, kind of like, you know, you have an a angel and a devil on opposite side of your shoulders. I'm hoping one of them is saying like, just come clean, come clean. I understand. I understand, just come clean. I said, you know what, like, we messed up. We didn't know what we we're doing. That acknowledgement of, of our missteps can be huge. You know, sometimes just saying sorry is enough. And I think in this case, I think saying sorry can, can be a huge thing to really put things, some like hard feelings to rest. You know, I, I spoke recently with a doctor who said about this moment in time, with the pandemic, we, we can't, when we have patients in the hospital, very often we can't cure them, but we can heal them. Yeah. Does that resonate with you? It does, it does. You know, we talk about, you know, there's this idea of intergenerational trauma. Now everybody knows about it, right? For many years, people thought this was just like a myth. A myth. A myth. Um, and one of the things that goes alongside with that, right? And this goes, it's connected to some like, you know, indigenous teachings and healings and ceremonies is that we, get to reconcile what our grandparents experienced. That it'll be our responsibility to put some of that trauma to rest. How we do it, you know, whether through, through therapy or ceremonies. Well, it sounds like the ceremony was a form of therapy. Yeah, absolutely. And so for me, thinking back to what my grandfather experienced, seeing his father killed at the hands of the police, and we're in this moment now where we're trying to figure out what we do to the police. Like these things can become so abstract of like, why, why is it important to you? Why are these things so important to you? And I don't, I don't talk much about like that personal part of, of why this is important to me. But it's there. But it's there. But it's there and, it's, and it weighs. I know you're, you're, you're interested in, in looking back at the past and the past the German past and since we're also working here on this series with the, the, the Goethe Institute I want to bring a, a German thinker into this mix okay. and I because I'm a quotomaniac by profession I'm going to read a quotation to you and have you react to it it was written in the 1940 it was written in 1940 just a few months before Walter Benjamin committed suicide, and this is what he wrote. The only historian capable of fanning the spark of hope is the one who is firmly convinced that even the dead will not be safe from the enemy if he is victorious. Mm. How does this resonate for you? Even the dead are not safe. Yeah. Yeah, and it goes back to the, the just the erasure here in Los Angeles. You walk around Olvera Street, and the most you'll see about the Tongva is a plaque on the floor. You know, we get to step over their memory every day. We talk about the seven generations a lot. And for some folks, they, you know, they think seven generations forward, seven generations back, but that can also seem very abstract. Other tribal nations talk about it as within those seven generations, we're in the middle. Three generations forward, three generations back. And like I mentioned, back there's my grandfather. And so we also have to be thinking about the you know three generations forward. And and I'm very much about envisioning what happens to into the future. If we don't project ourselves into the future, do we even arrive there? You know? So this idea of, of removing this statue for the sake of being able to reimagine or imagine, envision a new way to exist in, in this, just in, even in this park, I think that's where, um, like, I really want to do a majority part of my work. 
I, I, you know, that imagining is, is a beautiful thing because there's no rules to it, right? We're not, we're not beholden by the constructs of, of, you know, this colonial project of the U.S. We're not beholden to these ideas of, of patriarchy or even gender or what it means to be like a citizen of a country. And in that envisioning, I think, is, is where we'll find our path forward versus trying to kind of live within this box that we're in at the moment. So going back to what's happening now, having a future without the police is easy for me. Having a future without um, the constructs of gender and patriarchy, they're easy, like they're easy to imagine. I think the hard, the hard part is, is just coming to terms that we can make that happen and letting go of, of, you know, these false narratives that are, you know, held up by statues and monuments at the end of the literally day. Held literally up. held up. You know, the moment this thing came down, values changed for people. Even for the security guards who ran over here and were like freaking out what's going on. And then it's the same security guards now who are happy to open up space for us. Like that shift, wow. That change. That change. Like they thought they were protecting something. Now they know that they're the caretakers of a space of, we're gonna imagine something different now. Together. And the dialogue might start. Yeah. A conversation might yeah. be initiated by that removal. Yeah. You know, and when I walked over with the security guard and, you know, he was asking if the ribbons were gonna come down, he was saying like, I hope they don't come down. It's like, I've been looking at this boring thing forever and finally some color. And now, through what you said, I even know what those colors could mean. Yeah. You know, so thinking about that quote, right, that even the, the dead are held hostage by the past. Right. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the beautiful things that has come from these removals is, is the coming together of people to talk about how we envision the future. And, you know, in partnership with the Goethe Institute and Monument Lab, and even now, like even having the county be co-conspirators in this, right? Having them on board and being able to say like, okay, we, we, we need to do this. Um, in October, there's gonna be a series of programs, you know, through the Goethe, we're doing, we're thinking future ancestral monuments. Which is w wonderful, wonderful, right? This yeah. idea of trees and the ecology that trees bring to us from the little squirrels to the acorns to the birds and everything that like help us sustain ourselves when we think about sustainability and, and humanity and the climate crisis at the moment and then you know bringing elders together to talk about the multiple layers of these public spaces how do we how have these public spaces been used either for for bringing people together or for keeping people away from one another too right this this park gets policed in a certain way so it keeps people away these ideas of the founding of Los Angeles keeps people away. And then strategy, like how, how can others take this information, feel agency to remove these you, monuments? And, you, and use it. And a, use it. Use, use, uh, you, use all, all the research that you have done in the archives to actually make history active. Yeah. By taking this one down, there exists a threat now in the city and because, I mean, a bunch of them came down across California, too. That threat exists that these two other statues that remain up can be taken down by the will of the community. And that's easy. It's easy to take it down, right? But with what we did with the county, making them part of the process, I think with the city as well, having them be part of the process and let them have their own release, let them have, let them have their own moment of, of, of reckoning, I think is important. So those will, those will come down soon. Are you working on that now? We're working on You're that working. now. You're yeah. working. And it's through, the, through an organi organization. Community. Community. Community at this point, you know? You know, I was, I was reading that Christopher Hawthorne yes. leads a civil memory working group. Mm -hmm. What do you think might be the difference between that and what you have called for in the past a decolonial task force? At this moment, we can have one without the other. And my work is finding ways that they both work together and that there's that bridge. 
that there's that bridge between the institution and the community. And, and that's happening now, you know. I'm in touch with Rostin, I've spoken to Chris, um, I know some of the folks on that task force, and the removal advanced their work like a year, you know. They were planning on doing some things a year out, and it moved up the schedule. So they're working, and, you, and it's that, like we just have to find the ways of, of linking efforts, bringing in community. I firmly believe that when there's a community process alongside these institutional process, we get the best of everything. It makes space for that non-institutional expertise to come forward and bring these new ideas. Because that's where the, where the imagination is really, like the imaginative work, that innovative work is happening alongside community. Folks who haven't been, who don't have these resources to think, how do we honor our, our ancestors? How do we honor these individuals in our community who do good and we don't have the money to forge a statue and put it there? So bringing these two frames of mind together is something that's important. And this shaping the past is helping do that to an extent. Um, and, you know, the county is hosting another series of, of projects thinking, you know, using like one Tongva elder, Cindy Alvitre, is using VR to talk about their creation story, how they came to this place called Los Angeles. You know, using technology to, for that moment, create a whole new different type of monument. It, we, we didn't touch upon this before, but um, the statue now is in, in an air-conditioned nightmare. When it comes out, should it, what should be done with it? Do you, are you someone who believes that maybe it should be put in a, in a cultural center or museum and have school children and others learn about it in a, in a more judicious way? Or, or would that be a mistake? I, w I, w I visited the Citadel in, in just outside of Berlin last year. And when we walked in, there's all these statues. And everybody's like, oh my God, because they're beautiful, right? Beautiful marble statues. And there was this reverence to them, good or bad. And it was like, didn't nobody know what to do. And then the directors are like, you can touch them. And, then, and you can hear everybody just sigh and then start like to giggle and run around like little kids, touching them. And, and I think it's, if we remove that reverence, I, it's okay to have them in a museum. I think it's okay to have them, you know, in a building where, where people can learn and, and talk about how they see these things. It's that reverence that creates some danger. The Columbus statue sits somewhere in a yard somewhere right now, also in storage. And it's been DSS, it's no longer part of the county collection. They put out a bid for anybody who wants to take it. Two people bid on it, myself and then the warehouse where it's at, because they say like, well, we'll keep it here alongside these uh, whole bunch of other like statues that they have there. What happens to them afterwards? Who knows, you know? I think the, the, the more work we do in demystifying these things, the less they become a danger to like these, these powerful ideologies that, that have caused so much harm. Yeah, so whether it's in a, you know, behind a vitrine in a, in a building, or it gets melted down scrap metal for something, you know, like that's the only worth that it has, scrap metal right now, then we'll see. But it's a, I think it has to be decided amongst by, by the, by the people. Yeah. Yeah. Joel, thank you so much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very, this very much. Great.